Welcome, everyone. I'm Angelo Robles. I'm the host of the Angelo Robles podcast, and I'm the founder and CEO at Family Office Association. We have a return guest today, and one I've been looking so eagerly in terms of having back on. He's one of my favorites, and that would be the one and only Mark Faber. He's the editor and publisher of Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report. When I first founded Family Office Association about 2007, Mark was really one of the people I looked to for kind of global inspiration, insight, and providing value to my members and relationships. Now, I try... I try to be an optimist where I can, but I think what caught my attention was among the three words in Mark's newsletter, gloom, boom, and doom, I guess you could argue two of them are kind of negative. So maybe Mark looks at things through a little bit of a what could go wrong lens as well. Mark, how are you? It's been a long time. I'm well, thank you very much. And I hope you and your viewers as well. And that I they survive all the financial ups and downs well. <laughs> now, hopefully it won't be too gloomy and doomy today in terms of our conversation, but Mark, I am prepared. I have my trustworthy cigar. I have a nice Woodford Reserve whiskey ready to go. So we're going to have a good time today and let's see where it goes. <laughs> Great. There's over $4 trillion of cash on the sidelines during this continuing recession. Some will argue it's not. I'm going to say it is. What makes it different this time compared to in the past? Well, first of all, uh, when we look at the events such as we have at the present time, we'll, we always have to look at what are the causes of the malaise? What are the causes of the disruptions in daily lives, in uh, financial markets? And uh, I have to say, we have to go back to the last major crisis, 2008, 2009, and the consequences of which were that central banks uh, believed that they can solve all the problems by keeping interest rates artificially low and by printing money. So they printed money and kept uh, interest rates essentially in the US, as you know, around the zero level for essentially more than 10 years, uh, starting with the end of 2008 until 2020, 21, when they began to increase interest rates. But during that whole period of time, uh, they argued, well, there's no inflation. Well, the way they look at inflation, there was maybe no inflation. But the way normal people look at inflation and people who have knowledge of uh, economic um, affairs, there was inflation, but it wasn't so much in consumer prices because you have to see that over the last 20 years, China opened up and China with its opening and its competitiveness put pressure on consumer good prices. But what went up are asset prices, in other words, real estate prices. And uh, as a result of the rise in real estate prices, also rents and so forth, stock prices went up, bond prices went up, collectibles went up, and of course, cryptocurrencies went through the roof. We all look like and, investment geniuses. <laughs> yes, so everybody said, oh, this is uh, all great. We can continue to print money and this is uh, a wonderful environment. And as you can imagine, the portfolio managers and everybody in the financial sector and everybody who benefits from rising asset prices, uh, real estate brokers, stock brokers, fund managers, they all applauded the central banks who kept interest rates artificially low. And that laid the seeds for the current price increases that we're seeing. And so the Fed uh, belatedly started to increase interest rates. They were a little bit better than the ECB and the Bank of Japan, but they were late. 
And so they increased rates and the rate of increase has been sharp. But the rate of inflation such as we have today, say every household has a different rate of consumer price inflation. Exactly. Your household, I don't know, you have children or you have uh, dependents uh, in your family. I do, and I have very, very high personal inflation, Mark. <laughs> it's so not. You, let's say 9%. your inflation is, say, 8%. Oh, it's probably 20%, but okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, it may be 20%. I'm not disputing that. I'm just trying to explain that some people have a low rate of inflation, but suddenly it jumps. My inflation is not so high so far because beer hasn't gone up for the last two years in Thailand. And <laughs> uh, I managed to get cigarettes at a lower price. So these have gone up in price, Mark, my cigars. Yeah, yeah, sure. A lot, maybe doubled. Yes, yes. So my inflation, that's what I mean. You're correct. It's yes, very personal. Absolutely. No, it must be between six and, as you say, 15 to 20 percent, depending on the household and where the household lives and so forth and so on. And taxes, by the way, what you have to pay the government for everything is going up all the time, except the quality of the government is going down all the time at the same time. So we would have to adjust this uh, <laughs> that things are going downhill i know don't we advice because the quality is tumbling anyway uh, to make the point say in the 70s when inflation was at this level uh the discount rate went to 12 percent in 1973-74 then yes. it fell by half to 6%, but then it rose again into 1980-81. But at the present time, I'm uh, sorry to say, and you pointed out to this liquidity, we have still plenty of liquidity around that was printed in 2020. And a little bit has been taken back, but not all that much. And interest rates, the 10-year notes in the US, the 10-year government bond is yielding to today 3.35%. In other words, the rate of interest is negative in real terms. Exactly. You understand? The prices yeah, go up more taxes. than the bond yield or your deposit rate. This well, that's the actual... To the this purchase sort of uh, expropriation by the government. Uh, exactly, that's what it is. Related to that question, with all this cash, trillions largely remaining on the sidelines, will it end up being deployed? What's the scenario where this happens? Well, as you see today, you have the NASDAQ going ballistic, Meta is up like 23 or 25 percent. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> These are symptoms that there is too much liquidity. If there, if there was tight liquidity, this speculation would not happen at the present time. The Fed is actually in a very difficult position because, uh, in my view, they would have to really bring uh, inflation under control. They would have to increase the Fed fund rate to about 8%, 9%. Yes, exactly. And the government is bankrupt at 8%. Because the government debt has to be paid in. Uh, you understand the whole system. Exactly is not geared to that, whereby I have to say or make one observation. If you travel today to Turkey, to Istanbul, say, you will have an inflation of around 80% per annum, eight zero, okay? And you walk around the street and you go to restaurants and you go shopping, all functions reasonably well. 
the system can adjust for a while to high rates of inflation before it collapses. This is for your optimism. It leads to a collapse. But in the meantime, during this period of excess liquidity that fuels the price increases, there are huge opportunities in the stock market and in the property market. If we discussed it a little bit, but if inflation, according to the US government, is 6.5%, this is down from 9% back in June, yet it's still far, far ahead of the Fed's goal of 2%. Do you think on paper they'll get to 2% by later this year? Maybe they'll get there one day, but it will huh. be in an environment of depression. when everything collapses. But before they get there, they may get to 20% or 30%. I mean, that's not technically hyperinflation, but that's very, very high. This is gonna go- well, to I would say once you're at 30%, uh, the past is that it will go to 40%. And once you're at 40%, it exactly. will go to 50%. You, you understand? Yes, it's, uh, it's a progression and you can stop this progression at any time, but it is extremely painful. And looking at the central bankers, I've never seen in my life, I worked already 50 years since 1970. I started working in 1970 on Wall Street. I've never seen such a low quality of central bankers around the world. Lagarde in Europe, she's the head of the ECB. She has no clue whatsoever about economic issues. She's a lawyer. A lawyer could learn, but she has the arrogance that she doesn't think that she needs to learn anything. And Powell the same, he doesn't know much. He never read all the economic classical books. Yellen and is clueless. Yellen is a clueless person. Uh, for a little context to everyone, Mark is an extremely experienced global investor. He's a Swiss-born economist, has had business interest in Hong Kong and Asia for years, and currently lives in Thailand, but very much has a global outlook. Let's talk a little bit about how this all ties together with global employment. We all know the biggest tech companies have cut back a lot, a lot, yet I guess you could say their stock price the last couple of weeks has done relatively well. Is this going to be a continuing trend? Well, uh, you see, if you look back at the markets 2020 to today, we had in 2020 a sharp sell-off in February, March, and then a rally, okay? And uh, what rallied a lot are the momentum stocks, the meme stocks, the uh, uh, unicorns, SPACs, and so forth. So that then went up strongly, and it peaked out in January, February, 2021. So these stocks, January 2021, we're 2023. So a lot of these stocks, I call them the garbage stocks, have been in bear markets already for two years. They became very oversold, like Carvana or AMC or GameStop and so forth. And also the big stocks, the fine stocks, they were down. You can watch the ARC Innovation Fund. ARC was down at the bottom around 80% from the peak. It's also run by a genius in financial matters. She should be the next central bank. Then they we would have money printing like there is no tomorrow. <laughs> Which Cassie Wood at the central bank at the Federal Reserve. Uh, the markets will go ballistic. 
Uh, yeah, they will go ballis ballistic. Yeah. Relative to employment, and I'll harp on it a little bit, the guest I had on, an expert on AI two days ago, Craig Kaplan, like the impact of AI is going to be startling. We're seeing some of it now with chat GPT impacting <laughs> creativity and creative jobs, white collar, finance, legal, accounting, blue collar, mechanical, et cetera. They're, you know, we're entering into an era where likely that's going to be a hockey stick in terms of its exponential growth of the advancements of AI. Are you concerned with government's engagement in this and the future of jobs? Well, the future of jobs, I'm never concerned because there are plenty of jobs in every society. But the jobs change, you understand? With the skill level you had maybe 40 years ago, uh, you need to adjust and uh, to the changes and acquire new skills. So when you enter professional life, you always have to learn and learn and learn. Otherwise, you're suddenly left behind. But this is uh, in every generation has been the same. People who were driving uh, horse carriages, they had to learn how to drive a car and to adapt to modern life and so forth. So this is normal. But the one thing I am, well, I'm not concerned, but I'm just stating, I think that the internet and a lot of technologies have dumped down the population. And I explained to you why say before, when I was writing an essay, I had to do the corrections myself and then retype it and so forth. Nowadays, I just go to word correct and uh, the computer will correct my text, which is a great help for me because I'm not very good at orthography. <laughs> so it, and now with the, uh, this, uh, in this uh, artificial intelligence, someone can maybe go and uh, ask to write an essay for a doctor's title. And he can write an essay better than you can. I'm, I've seen text messages on uh, essays of this GP uh, okay. AI, which are actually stylistic better than what I could write. What does it do to me? I mean, I, for me, I'm writing two newsletters a month. In theory, I could ask uh, artificial intelligence to write them for me. I, yes, Mark, and that's like the whole, the whole point. So here's what Dr. Kaplan said. He said within a couple of years, that means a couple, whatever, two to five, Within a couple or several years, artificial intelligence will be a trillion. Now, maybe it was a little bit of hyperbole. He didn't say a million. He said a trillion times smarter than the smartest human. And yeah, I can believe that. Look, if you play chess, uh, artificial intelligence can beat essentially the best chess player. Well, that started like 25 years ago. It's, it, yeah, it's yeah, sure. But I'm, I'm saying that so you and I, we are average chess players, or in my case, a bad chess player because I was oh, playing pretty good, Mark. Oh, pretty years. Good. But let's say if I, I play against the computer, the computer will win hands down. Well, then we better stick to playing humans. <laughs> uh, our real incomes, that's the key word, our real incomes declining globally. This is a very good question that is seldom addressed because the answer is embarrassing for central bankers. <laughs> Throughout the Western world, we, uh, these are statistics, they're not invented by Mark Faber. These statistics are produced by the Federal Reserve. They have them, except these lunatics in the central bank in America in, at the Fed, they look, don't look at them. They only look at things that are convenient for them, namely their exposure 
giving speeches and the fees they cash in here and there from all kinds of sources. But the point is this, your parents or I compared to my daughter at the age of 35 in real terms, I earned more than the generation after me and I had larger assets than the generation Z or the millennials. This is a fact established by the Federal Reserve. And you can see yourself, let's say a lot of people, they get the salary, but in Europe, the inflation is 9% in the EU and the salary level goes up by three, four percent. That's why they have so many strikes. Exactly. And we hinted at that earlier, but I wanted to nail it home specifically. I want to make this very clear. When some commentators and people that interview me, they say, My, but look, everything is okay. Everybody has a job and so forth. I say, no, it's not okay. Young people have a great difficulty in acquiring assets in buying a house, in paying the rent. I know many people, believe me, through my newsletter, and I always ask them, by the way, what are your children doing? And they all say, well, they're working here, working there. And then it turns out, they all say, well, of course we help them. In other words, we bought them a condo here or we give them some money there. Because on their own, they wouldn't be able to afford the same standard of living than the parents. It's funny that you bring that up because my next question relates a little bit to that. Here it comes. Does the mental state of the young ones, generation Y and Z, affect the future of the economy? Yes, of course. But we have there... You know, because I have more time now, uh, I don't take new clients. I just have my business and I run it and I write my newsletters and I travel less. But I want to say the, about the mental state of people. The school system has brought about uh, a culture of everyone being a victim. Okay, my parents were divorced, so I'm a victim. I can't do this because my mother was such and such and my father such and such. And I have to drink beer because my father drank a lot of whiskey and you have to smoke a cigar because hey, your grandparents you came from Cuba and so forth and so on. Everybody has an excuse continuously. Continuously. And is a victim of something. And... The school system has educated people. You know, we have statistics about who has sympathy for the LGBTQ community. The boomers, like I'm born 1946, the boomer, uh, very few are in favor of the LGBTQ uh, community. But as we get into the millennials and the generation C, the C uh, generations, the youngest, uh, you have up to 15% that sympathize with this community. It's still a minority, but this minority has kind of forced the majority into a position to accommodate their wishes and everything. Mark, are you trying to get me in trouble? So, so <laughs> what I want to say is... I have enough trouble on my platform already. <laughs> so what I want to say is we have a young generation of people. What is their problem? Their problem is that they never had a problem. I grew up in a generation. They went through... My grandparents went through World War I. World War II. My grandfather, I can show you the picture... He built a hotel in 1910 in the mountains in Switzerland. It was a luxury resort. Then, <laughs> four years after 1910, World War I. How many tourists come during the World War I? <laughs> Zero. They had the boom in the 20s, but it was hyperinflation in Germany. 
1918 to 1923 was also a disaster. And then came the depression. When the depression lifted, World War II happened. The, the, he, he had really a tough life, staying alive in his business with the hotel. They had to work, the whole family worked every day. The young generation is a spoiled generation, period. I, you will, of course, your viewers, if they're young, they will say, well, he's, a, he's an antiquity, he's an old, uh, grumpy old man. Oh, Not I get all. that all the time. I'm just saying, very few generations in the world grew up in a completely uh, peaceful time. This exactly. time after, this, after the Vietnam War, which was finished in 75, after that, very few people in America had to go into anything that resembled hardship. And all this generation, they never lived under socialism. That's why they... Uh, they like the policies of the socialists. Yeah, you could get me started on the woke community and that will get me in more trouble still. A related question. Why do these generations resent the top 1% so much? Are the resentfuls conditioned to be resentful? <laughs> <laughs> I, I tell you, uh, I mean, I've read Marx and I have all the first editions of all the communists and socialists from the, the 19th century and the 18th century. The socialist ideology is built on uh, essentially destruction. You make someone responsible, the rich, the capitalists are responsible for the poverty of the poor. This is a, a false premise. Uh, the capitalists, say, of the 19th century in America, the so-called robber barons, they built the railroads. Well, most people use a railroad. So the capitalists who built with their own capital the railroads, yes, they became rich, but it allowed people to travel. And the capitalists who financed the development of airplanes. Well, what happens? Poor people also travel in airplanes. So uh, the capitalistic system, if you look, never before in the world did we have the prosperity the Western world enjoyed over the last 150 years. Never before. Exactly. The poverty rate worldwide has gone down. Now, I admit that in the system of capitalism, there can be abuses, uh, especially when you have central banks that are run by people who may have ill intentions. I would say that is a possibility that central bankers, if you look at the background and so forth, that they have ill intentions. But uh, in general, the capitalistic system has lifted any, everyone out of deep poverty into a better life. You take China. I went to China. Actually, I went already in the 1950s to a socialist country, to Yugoslavia. Very poor. All these countries. Uh, then when they opened up after the Berlin Wall fell in 89, the economy took off like a rocket and the standards of living went up. 2019, it was the last peak year for China before the COVID lockdown. 140 million Chinese traveled outside the country. But the Western media, all you hear is that this is a despotic government and so forth and so on. We are this despotic government with NATO. NATO is a criminal organization. Same to CIA and the FBI. Oh, we're going to get to NATO and some of that, assuming we don't run out of time. Uh, <laughs> Better uh, not. <laughs> oh, no, because we got to get to the good stuff, and that will definitely be a part of it. Why? 
Why were bonds and stocks both in a bear market in 2022 kind of a unique combination? This is, uh, this is correct. This is the, the unusual feature of the last uh, this or current crisis that stocks went down and bonds collapsed. Never before did it happen because in the depression, 1929 to 32, uh, bonds rallied, government bonds. And in 73, 74, same, bonds rallied. And in 81, 82, recession, bonds rallied. And so forth. So you're correct. This is very unusual. But as I explained to you before, we have to look back at what preceded the crisis and the artificially low interest rates had pushed bond prices up to the sky where the 10 years US treasury at the low yield yielded 0.59%, okay? When inflation was already heading towards 4%. That, yes. When you think of it, the central banks have messed up everything so badly. But they will say, well, there's a, the Putin is the reason for inflation here. This is the problem with government officials. Nobody stands up and says, I made a mistake. They will always blame someone else. Same like the Generation Z and the millennials. Oh, it's not my fault. I'm the victim of all this. I'm not the criminal. Uh, I'm a victim. I had to commit the crime because the voice told me to, that I needed to commit this crime. Yeah, I mean, I didn't comment on it, but the, the victimhood mentality from what we spoke before is the worst. It's not positive. It's not going to make you an entrepreneur. It's not going to make you rich. Might you sometimes be right? Yes. And... The world doesn't give a shit. You just have to be, you have to have a plan. You have to move forward and that things are going to be against you. Well, welcome to the real world. That's just how it yes. is. And we are all humans in my business. <laughs> I would be the richest man in the world if I would always take right investment decisions. <laughs> will, will the Fed pause in 2023, causing a bond market rally, could they go back to zero? I don't think we'll go back to zero because uh, you, you understand, now there's a credit quality issue coming up. Can the government pay in the long run? I mean, some people will have to ask themselves. I always maintain a diversified portfolio of bonds, stocks, real estate, and precious metals. But I have to say, in the last two years, I only bought bonds for trading purposes. And uh, about three months ago, two months ago, corporate bonds became inexpensive. In other words, emerging market bonds. There's an ETF, EMB. You can see how the price moved. It moves around with uh, emerging markets. So uh, there are opportunities, but I think in the long run, I wouldn't buy bonds. Uh, I, I'd rather be in cash and in equities. But I believe that markets will become very volatile. So say the treasury bond, there's also an ETF, the TLT. Uh, it's a 20 years plus treasury bond ETF. The low was 92. It trades now at 108. And uh, we were up. 260 or 170 two years ago. So we fell a lot and we, I think we can rebound to around 120. But afterwards, uh, in my view, we'll go down again. In what scenario does the 10 year go to 20%? Well, I think that in the current scenario where the Fed I wrote a report recently and said that in my view, the Fed uh, will not increase interest rates 
to the extent that they become positive in real terms. I explained to you before that in real terms, wages are below the rate of inflation, wage increases are below the rate of inflation, and interest rates are below the rate of inflation. This is the perfect, and I repeat, the perfect environment to solidify, embed inflation into the system. <laughs> True. In my opinion, the central banks who say that uh, their goal is to bring inflation down to 2%, they are lying. They know they can't do it. We have an inverted yield curve in the U.S., I guess Germany as well. Are we currently in a recession? The politicians seem to deny it. Well, I've written extensively about this, and I think we are in a recession already. If you measure the typical household, you know, the typical people, not people on Wall Street, but even some people on Wall Street earn less than a year ago. <laughs> including the CEO of Goldman Sachs. But it doesn't matter whether you are in 30 million or 20 million. Uh, it doesn't reduce your coffee consumption and the smoking habit of your expensive cigars. But uh, in general, I would say for most people, and I am an economist, I think it's more important to observe how people live. If you go out uh, by observing the spending habit of people, you, you get a picture of can they afford? And I can tell you when you look around, people are, are tightening the belt a bit. They, they have to, they don't yes. have the money. They don't have the money. If they stopped quantitative tightening, what happens with the yield curve? Well, in my view, uh, the reaction to yesterday's modest increase in interest rates in the Fed fund rate by one quarter percent, that surprised me because I think it's bearish for the bond market. It's not bullish. Hmm. But uh, there is a big short position in bonds, so maybe you know the shorts covered and so forth. But in general, I think I would feel more comfortable if the Fed, as Henry Kaufman, the economist, argued, the sure. Fed should hit uh, the investors with a fist in their face, <laughs> a slap in their face. But what the Fed does is as Arthur Burns, the Fed chairman in the 70s, did increased interest rates. But it was always, you can watch it, there are tables and charts on the subject. Interest rates throughout the 70s stayed more or less negative all the time in real terms. In other words, interest rates were below the rate of inflation as it is now. Uh, and for one of our viewers who submitted an email to me, David Kay, thank you so much. I'm going to, it was very deep. I'm going to crystallize it into a question for Mark. How can the U.S. sustain or hard reset its debt-driven system that is at least $100 trillion in debt when adding up municipal, state, federal, and private debt? Look, the system will break. We, we, there's no question about this. Uh, the debts can only repay through inflation. You know, you have to inflate it. But by doing that, you also accumulate more debt, mm -hmm. and you can postpone the collapse of the system, but you cannot evade it. Uh, yeah, well, that's the question is very good. The question is a very fundamental issue. But I, the question should be, I, as an investor, I know uh, the system is kept artificially uh, alive. 
Yes. And before I collapse, before we all die, how do I best navigate through the system of lunatics that are running the central banks throughout the world? They're lunatics. They don't want a sound economic system. They want, uh, they know they can't have a sound economic system because the collapse would happen instantly. <laughs> so if they keep the, they keep the charade going. If it can it's like not... the US government, the Republicans and the Democrats is all kabuki theater. It's a one party system. And it is no longer representing the interest of the people, but actually representing its own interest and only its own interest. No <laughs> consideration whatsoever for the individuals. A politician mm -hmm. couldn't care less about anybody. You know more about the American system than Americans do. Well, if we are not better in Europe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If it cannot sustain, or hard reset, how many generations of decline will be required to get sustainable given the current debts represented by wealth of currently all alive generations? Well, I'd say, uh, in my opinion, you know, I say, how do you go bankrupt first slowly and then suddenly? <laughs> As the Indian group Adani noticed, <laughs> suddenly in one oh, yeah. month the whole thing collapsed. We're going to uh, get taken to. <laughs> uh, we don't know. Two years ago, I wouldn't have known that the world is that stupid to go to a war that may become World War Three over some uh, insignificant territory for the Western world in Eastern Ukraine. Yeah, let me ask a I question. Mean, this is the most preventable war ever. People say, how could people go to World War I? Is acknowledge the stupidity, in, an incredible stupidity, how World War I began. But this one also is even worse. Because Let's we ask... should have learned something, but you know, the, this is the governments never learn anything. No, I'm going to ask a question kind of related to that and hitting back to what we, I promised I would bring up about NATO. The head of NATO strategic group states that NATO economies must transition to wartime footing, a la the US in World War II, which is the Western world's plan to reset the economy. Question has to be, will they actually get their global war? And if they don't, then what? We don't know because it depends on some lunatic that uh, provokes the Chinese into entering a war situation. They managed to do it with Putin. I mean, they provoked Putin. Uh, they could have the NATO countries and NATO is basically the US. The US could have said <laughs> Ukraine does not join NATO. We want Ukraine as a neutral territory. And there would be no... That would be, you're right. That's all. The time. There wouldn't be a war. I completely agree with you. That's a very unpopular opinion with the populace here in the US because they're uneducated. They don't think for themselves. And they don't really understand the global issues that you're talking about. And many of them haven't traveled around the world and seen it. Well, I'm sorry to say that I agree with you, but at the same time, you also have to see who is responsible for this view. Uh, it's CNN and the media, and the media and the government is one and the same. It would yeah, be- well, who's, who's behind that? Who's behind the media and the government? Who are the powers that be? And- Well, okay. this is the deep state. I, I tell you, uh, when you look at M Mr. Biden and Mr. Trump and so forth, these are all puppets. Someone tells them what to do. Okay, let's get into probably what's going to get me in trouble then, Mark. We'll just jump right into it. Is the WEF, the World Economic Forum, a front for fascist? It is 
an organization that was started by someone called Schwab. White Claw Schwab. Schwab. His father was a Nazi, uh, belonged to the Nazi uh, party. Now, by itself, to belong to the Nazi party doesn't necessarily make someone a bad person. In general, they're not particularly good, but I know very famous artists who were Nazi members because for a while in Germany, in order to improve your social position and economic position, it was a huge advantage to be a member of the Nazi party. The way maybe in the US, it's an advantage to be a member of the Republican party or the Democrats or support them with uh, you know contributions. And in China, definitely, it's an advantage to be a member of the Communist Party. The Communist Party in China is over 100 million members. And most of them, the leadership, especially are highly educated people. I can't say that of the Democrats. When I look at the Democratic leadership and the Republican leadership in America, uh, some are a disaster. You look at the vice president. She's re she looks like a retarded person. I go back to the question, if you had to answer it as yes or no, do you think the WEF is a front for fascist? Well, they have, uh, it's, a, it's a front for an elite. Some have very socialist uh, tendencies. And it's a, it's a front for people who want power. They are people who actually think that uh, people should be led and that they, as members of the WEF, are the elite that are destined to lead them. You look at someone who is also half retarded, uh, this uh, Jacinta, Adern, she was the prime minister of New Zealand. She just re <laughs> she resigned recently. Now, she was a member of the WEF and Schwab applauded her. But at home, she's a member of the Socialist Party and had very socialist policies. The WEF doesn't stand uh, essentially for socialists or fascists. They stand for their own power and for ruling the world. According to them, the WEF should be the kind of a global government. Tough yes. luck that 80% of the population in the world uh, doesn't like the WEF. Now, we're not gonna have the time today, but that could lead into a discussion on central bank di digital currencies, programmable money, where let's say they're, push they're pushing a climate change agenda. And here in the US, we have a central bank digital currency, God forbid, but one day it's probably inevitable, hopefully not programmable money. Oh, you can't buy meat more than XYZ number amounts per month, or you can't fly on this plane. We are heading in that direction. I'm not sure it's gonna perfectly go there. I hope not, but we are trending towards a world where those kind of people, uh, that I would say are kind of quote unquote, the agenda that the WEF is pushing, that is a world they would like us to be in. Correct. But I want to tell you something about this world. If you, and this is a, a general observation, you know, I've been, uh, as I said, already in the 50s to Yugoslavia, and then in the 60s, uh, when I was ski racing, we went to ski races in Eastern Europe. As, and then I traveled a lot to, to China early on in, the, in 1980, when it was just beginning to open up and to Russia the same and so forth and to Vietnam. So I am familiar with the totalitarian regime that socialism brings along. Because socialism is basically uh, if you look at the forest, the tall trees and short trees, in the socialist ideology, you have to cut down the tall trees and make them all equal. That is the problem of socialism. 
you're not creating things you're cutting down things and but anyway great analogy i, I want to tell you uh, i've seen the misery under which people lived in the socialist system and the poverty under which they lived now some philosopher may come to me and say mark yes they were very poor but uh, philosophically they were all happy that i dispute because people like to be free but the point i want to make on the socialism everything was forbidden you know everything was state controlled but there were free markets the black market and i can tell you once they will introduce all these uh, uh, tracking systems and so forth uh, people will find ways to evade them so in a city in your neighborhood they may start to use uh, cigarette packages as money like in prisoner war camps or they may use coins then they use uh, silver or gold coins or platinum coins and so someone will provide the means of exchange in the black market and i actually think already today uh, we have great difficulties at measuring economic statistics because the black market has grown a lot ha, very good point i don't want to go into details but i can tell you uh, in the country i live we have uh, widespread smuggling of course Mark, I think I'm going to go round robin with some quick questions and answers because I think my audience is going to want to hear your opinions about this. Fine. And then, I'm to, then I'm going to ask for a request, but why don't we get started now? What's the future consequences? I, I think you hinted at it, but nonetheless, what's the future consequences of the Fed keeping rates artificially low? You said short answers. The consequence will be future inflation. Okay. Future will the, price increases. Will the stock market drop 20% in real terms, but actually rise in nominal terms? Yes. Okay, that's a short answer. That gets right to it. Uh, does the notional... It could fall by 80% in real terms and go up in nominal terms. Does the notional value of derivatives put the whole financial system at risk for a black swan? Yes, uh, there is a risk. Would you classify that risk as incredibly small or not as small as we would like it to be? I think it's uh, more significant uh, than uh, we think. And if it's not yet significant, it will become significant. Why are central banks buying so much gold? Well, some have been selling gold, but uh, I always say gold is uh, the belief uh, that you cannot trust paper money and that you can't trust central bankers. And the central bankers, uh, they are educated morons. You understand? They've been to university. They know that uh, the value of paper money is going down because they can see themselves with their eyes that the quantity of money is increasing at a faster pace than the growth rate of the economy. So that is inflationary. Uh, so they are now moving back into gold. But equally, central banks are people, they sell something when it's low, and they buy when it's high. <laughs> uh, in what scenario, probably a bad one, but in what scenario does gold go to four to $5,000 an ounce? It will go there, but I don't predict when. And I don't buy gold because I think that it will go up tomorrow. You understand? I've been buying gold for the last essentially 40 years. I buy every month a little bit. I watch the price, of course, because I occasionally have trading positions and occasionally have investments in gold mining shares that are more volatile than gold itself and have positions in gold and silver and platinum. But in general, I think that 
as long as you have our central bankers, just look at them. You can be sure that gold will go up in the long run. Just look at them and listen to the nonsense that they speak. Hmm. Are rare earths the next bubble? I beg your pardon? Are rare earths minerals? Are rare earths the next bubble? <laughs> well, yes, but a bubble is a bubble. You know, you don't know when it's going to burst. And some uh, rare earths have moved up and others haven't gone up yet and others will move up. But rare earths depend on industrial production. Gold, silver, platinum don't depend on industrial production. So in other words, the monetary aspect of gold is higher than for other industrial commodities. Are food shortages, again, are food shortages on the horizon? Well, there are books about civilizations and how they collapsed. Interestingly, no civilization has collapsed because the weather got warmer. It's actually very conducive for civilizations, warm weather. The problem is ice ages. <laughs> Many civilizations have collapsed. How true. How yeah. true. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if I were an activist and I wanted to shock the world, I would go and predict an ice age, not uh, global warming. <laughs> global warming is actually very good for agriculture. For agriculture, yes. I, I did promise I would ask a request, uh, and I'm still going to leave questions on the floor. But could I have another 10 or 15 minutes? Fine, 10 minutes. <laughs> okay, let's do it. Uh, is modern monetary theory to blame for inflation or and or rising wages and supply chain restrictions? Uh, the modern monetary theory is not modern. Uh, <laughs> it, the, the first uh, kind of uh, economist a lunatic anarchist who talked about it was Silvio Gesell mm -hmm. in the 19, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. He was a German anarchist. They kicked him out of Bayern and he went and stayed in an area uh, of Switzerland in the Jura. This is uh, the name, the, the Jurassic period comes from the Jura in Switzerland. Anyway, he stayed there and he developed a theory that essentially said the problem for the economy is that people save money because money is taken out of the system of circulation. So he wanted to introduce essentially uh, ex taxes on deposits and expropriation of say three or five percent per annum is like negative real interest rates. It is a tax, negative real interest rates. Inflation is a tax. It's not visible, but it's a tax. And, and uh, this, this uh, modern monetary theory has been altered somewhat to the extent that people say, well, it doesn't matter uh, how much debt the country has. Debts don't matter because the government's debt is a different from the household debt. If you have debts, you have to repay. The government can print money. And what does money printing do? Every child who went to the first course of economics, elementary, knows that money printing and in price inflation are something is connected. I'm not saying there, are, there can be shortages in one sector or another sector of the economy that develop independently from money printing. But in general, when the whole price level increases, it has to do with money printing and government expenditures. I recommend all your viewers to go and on YouTube, they can watch speeches 
Uh, sometimes the speech is only 10, 20 minutes long by Milton Friedman. He is an economist who has a sound uh, view or sound opinion about economics, but they distorted his views. Uh, do the powers that be create unnecessary wars and pandemics to make government cronies rich? Yes. Okay, that's keeping to the model of a War, simple <laughs> It's very, very profitable. Thomas Paine, uh, essentially the, the writer who led, I mean, his works led to the American revolution against the British, the war of independence. He said, this is throughout history, wars, have been a very profitable business for some people. It caused enormous hardship on the poor who go to the front line. I mean, if you were in the army of Napoleon in the front line, the chances of survival is next to zero. The Germans, World War II, they also had Strafbataillon. These were people, they had been punished. They were in the front lines. The survival uh, rate is next to zero. But the people sitting in Washington in the comfortable armchairs and getting kickbacks from the military com uh, complex and uh, responsible for sending uh, these innocent people to the front line, mm -hmm. they uh, benefit. Will BRICS? use central bank digital currencies backed by a basket of commodities and abandon the greenback? We don't know, but one thing I'm, I'm, I'm sure, and I've written about this, the dollar system, the reserve currency status of the US is going to end and it's in the process. And uh, it's ending largely because of the US. You understand the US is pursuing policies that are not acceptable to many countries. Yeah, I mean, that and was my next pursuing question. pursuing policies that are contrary to their own interests. That I want to state. Is the king dollar on its last leg? And is that one year or 10 yes, years? Yes, I think so. I think we're in a bear market for dollars. But uh, the other currencies are not much better, except for precious metals. Yes. Uh, maybe two more questions. Is there any scenario for a $200 barrel, especially utilizing the Brent? More international people will know what the Brent is from an oil perspective. I think $200 is not far out of... <laughs> Side, uh, I think uh, all you need is enough printing of money. But in my view, quite frankly, the central banks, if you look at the money printing exercise starting 1960 and up to now, each time it's been bigger. The last time was $4 trillion, okay? The next time it may be 20 trillion. It has to progress. It's all written in the literature of Hayek and Ludwig von Mises. Now, I do want to stick to the timeline, as I noted. So it's an impossible question to answer in a second, but I'll ask it. If I'm a multi-billion dollar family looking generationally and concerned about a lot of things, war, geopolitics, the future of energy, climate change, the WEF, political decisions here in the US, my God, I could go on and on. It's an, it's an endless series of risk and potential black swans, some the unknowns, we don't know what we don't know. How could I invest if I have all my money in currencies and stocks, what's to say that that spigot doesn't get shut off by government entities, it's all digital, I lose access to it, that leads me back to commodities. Do I physically own it? Do I own art? Do I own gold? Do, do I own even Bitcoin if that's not government controlled? What are some 
hedging or allocation recommendations that you would recommend to a significant family? The first observation I would have to that family, uh, if they're based in the US or they're based in Germany or wherever they're based, I would say, looking at history, especially uh, the history that followed uh, the First World War, the Second World War, and so forth, uh, and all the expropriations, I'd say you have to diversify geographically. Yes. Now, I'm not saying that if you have, say, your family office in uh, New York or in America, and you own properties in uh, China, and I would include today Hong Kong to China as a part of China. <laughs> uh, that 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 you can travel there. You, you understand? You will need a plane to go to Hong Kong, or you need a boat, a yacht. So this is a consideration. But I would move funds out of NATO countries and uh, of the Anglo-American Alliance, Australia, Canada, the US, UK. That is a first diversification geographically. But if you have all your money at JP Morgan or Citigroup to say, buy me stock ABC in Hong Kong is not a geographical diversification. The portfolio is still with Citi or with JP Morgan in New York, you understand? You have to have accounts in different sovereign countries. You have to have real estate in different sovereign countries. I completely 100% agree. After I give Mark a chance to share a little inf information on his newsletter and consulting, I do recommend that my live audience stays on. I'm going to give kind of a two-minute wrap-up, but it may include some important information that many of you would find valuable. Uh, I always have, Mark, I always have a hook. Uh, now Angelo, look, you were worried that I wasn't bearish enough. <laughs> uh, no, you were, <laughs> no, that was very good. But on that note, again, Mark... Faber, F-A-B-E-R, is the editor and publisher of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report. You have to go and subscribe. It's a no-brainer. I mean, just yes. go ahead and do it. Otherwise, you're, you're like an idiot. I mean, I'm just being direct and honest from my perspective. Mark, I'm assuming you may still be open potentially to families that reach out and want a little bit more hands-on perspective. Could they reach you through Gloom, Boom, and Doom? Is that a website? Uh, I believe yes, it's... I or my gloom, email is or my Yahoo. <laughs> Well, that would be gloomboomanddoom.com. Could they email or connect with yes, you? Yes, uh, yes. Worst, <laughs> worst case, case as a significant family, you could always, uh, and one of my relationships, you could certainly reach out to me. Is there anything else, Mark, whether it's a Twitter or anything like that, that you would like to promote? No, because I'm not in the promotional business. I think... Uh, the world has moved too much into promotion and too little into substance. I think it's very important to uh, have, you know, advisors that can offer you some substance. And the most promotional people usually are superficial. But I, I acknowledge some people have been very good at promoting their work and uh, have built a large business around hundreds of different newsletters and the kickbacks and everything, you know, that is okay. But uh, <laughs> normally wealthy people uh, have their own ideas, they're knowledgeable, uh, they have uh, employees and children that are well educated and understand uh, the complexity. We live today in a very complex society. Mm -hmm. And these complex societies, there's a very good book, How Complex Societies Collapse. <laughs> yes. you understand? If, you, if you are in New York City, you depend on electricity. You depend on the internet because no internet, no credit card. 
no access to money, no supply chain. And you or, are very vulnerable to food crisis because if the farmers don't send the food to the city, uh, in hyperinflation, this happens. The farmers don't want to sell their products because they get paper money that is in the evening worthless. Exactly. These are all things I talk about. So but all things are very it. interesting. And I tell you, uh, if you the rich family you refer to, I would say to myself, uh, this is an environment that is conducive to wealth destruction. So let's try to have a strategy. How do I lose the least money instead of a strategy of how much uh, money do, can I make? Incredibly well said. Again, we're so fortunate to have Mark Faber. We won't let two and a quarter years. <laughs> Don't say it's Oh, yes, yes, yes. Go by again. Mark, I am going to give my close. I understand if you have to leave us, I'll take about two minutes, but it was great to see you. I very much look forward to the next time. I enjoyed my Woodford Reserve, a couple of puffs of this, and I very much look forward to our next conversation. Yeah, the Woodford is a nice whiskey. It's a nice whiskey, indeed. Well, I everyone, prefer to drink black uh, red label because the red label is not a very good whiskey. So I drink less. <laughs> if I drink high quality whiskey, I drink too much because it's so smooth. <laughs> <laughs> that is uh, that is pretty good. Everyone. <laughs> I'm Angelo Robles. I'm the host of the Angelo Robles podcast. I'm the founder and CEO at Family Office Association. We're a global membership organization dedicated primarily to the interest of single family offices. Go to our website, familyofficeassociation.com or .us to learn more about membership and being involved. I did want to give a little bit of context. I really love this conversation with Mark. And of course, his opinions are his, mine are mine. Maybe we're right, maybe we're wrong. Who the hell knows? At the end of the day, think for yourself, make your own decisions. And everyone's situation is different. This is for entertainment and engaging educational from my perspective purposes, but at the end of the day, you have to make your own decisions. Kind of what I wanted to say, because I haven't been as active with my live Zooms, and those of you that would like to be more active in that, you know, reach out to me to my email, even to my text, and I'm pretty open with it. I'm 203-570-2898. We will be doing LinkedIn lives of interviews. I have a significant following on LinkedIn. If you don't follow me there, I'm simply Angelo Robles. So go and follow me there. I am on Apple and Spotify. That takes usually about a month for an interview that I select to be up on there. We're usually quicker on the ones I select on YouTube. So it's more video and video centric. And I'm simply family office. So you could find me on there. The bigger picture that I wanted to say, I'm definitely back. It's all better than ever. I'm really excited. We're doing a combination of intellectual work that I'm doing on my writing, my books, my master classes. We're going to get it back to do maybe not seven days a week like I used to, but more digital. And we're doing a lot of in-person events. If you're a member and you're not getting our stuff, then something's going wrong with the email communication. Reach out to me because we got to get that corrected. The bigger picture that I wanted to say, uh, and I had to leave questions on the cutting room floor. Uh, the family office industry, let's be honest with each other, is incredibly boring and vanilla. No one's pushing the envelope. There's no futuristic thinking. Uh, I push the envelope probably too much. I look different. I act different. And hopefully that's appreciated by those in the community. Yeah, those were some very sensitive questions about WEF, about woke, about this, about that. I guarantee you that other family office groups will keep it very down the middle and will not go down any of those directions. At the end of the day, it's our opinion and you make your own decision because we could very well be wrong, uh, but you should be open to other points of view and a conversation. Uh, I kind of like to tell people I'm probably not overly intellectual, and I'm not. I have average IQ, but I'm wickedly curious, and I'm quasi-creative. So that's the value that I bring. I would say use me more, especially from a member perspective. I know truckloads of people. I'm rather connected. I have some thoughts. There may be, they may be right. They may be wrong. That's going to be your decision to make. But the opportunity to engage in a non-vanilla, 
non-down-the-middle organization that is going to push the boundaries, which is why I've been spending a lot of time consulting, working with families on creating a multi-generational dynamic, quasi-anti-fragile, there's really no perfectly such thing, family office, and I've been incredibly more international and traveling than ever, ever before. I completely agree with Mark's last comments, which is why about two years ago, I started work on a project Call like sovereign risk assessment for families, especially U.S. sovereign risk. And there is a lot of things that could go wrong. The government's always confiscating your money through taxation, monetary policy, inflation, but it could get a lot uglier than that. I kind of renamed it. I'm going back and forth. Disaster prep for billionaires. Honestly, it's been kind of my life's work over the last two years. I think I'm probably more knowledgeable about it than anyone else that I know in the world. And yeah, there is work I'm doing for truly significant families that are really deep. Mark touched upon a little bit of it. Uh, diversity and residency and passports, owning assets and resources. Yes, your bank accounts could be frozen. Yes, your stock accounts could be frozen. Of course, look at what happened with the truck drivers in Canada. It could absolutely happen here in the US. You could have civil forfeiture. They take your assets. There's lots of things that could go wrong. You need to not only diversify assets and geographies, but have a game plan. How would you even move if there's COVID lockdown restrictions per state? I'm not saying I have perfect answers to all of this. And one day with the advent of programmable money, central bank digital currencies, and more and more AI and technology, it's going to get harder and harder. But if we are doomed within 50 years and have it be the best day of 50 years it could possibly be and have the freedom of movement and choices that I believe that the work that I do could help you on. So normally in these Zooms and recordings that go up on YouTube or Apple, I don't really go too deeply into this. I just try to keep it Q&A and move on. So I'm doing something a little different on this one because I really enjoy it. It's kind of ad hoc. I didn't really plan it, but I really enjoy the interview with Mark Faber. So again, imperfect. I always am. Uh, but I'd like to think that I'm curious. I'm creative. I think of things differently. Utilize me more. I hope to see many of you. I'm off next week, the week of beginning on the 9th of Wednesday to Phoenix for Super Bowl week. Uh, and if you're a member, you should have gotten invites. We're doing a former NFL and NBA player golf tournament. We're doing a pickleball tournament. We're doing a series of parties. We're doing a watch party on Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, I am then in New York. I'm then uh, in LA where we're extremely active. One of our members has an amazing home, an amazing estate in Beverly Hills. We're back at her home hosting a Sunday brunch on February 19th and a charity auction. We're getting more and more involved in philanthropic initiatives. I'm then back in New York. I think we're doing something on the 23rd of February and then back to LA where we're going to be active partnering with ACG and some other organizations with work that we're doing out there. We're also going to be active monthly, long story, in Kansas City. We are active. I'd like to be a little more active than we have been in Miami and South Florida, although we had an amazing bash in December at Art Basel. But again, what I'm trying to say is as an organization, we are busy. Reach out to us, learn more. If you're a member and not getting proper communication, reach out to me. It's great to see all of you. Great to be back to doing more live work and hope you all enjoyed it. On that note, everyone, I'm Angelo Robles. I'm going to say goodbye, and I'm off to New York City today. So goodbye and look forward to seeing you all next time.